Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to Actio. Um, this is our presentation for feedback to the Mojuloop community about the work that we are doing on an OSS anti-financial crime risk and risk management solution or a financial crime risk management solution. Um, this is our third PI, um, but we are collaborating with Mojuloop alongside the Mojuloop development team and the community um, for the 14th PI. So the work that we have done, um, this is, we have been here before a few times. My name is Justice Ortlep. Um, presenting with me is Darshan Gakari, our architect. Our platform is a solution that is co-developed between Lextago and Cybern. Cybern is doing a lot of the development work and Lextago is providing a lot of the architecture and design and planning. Um, just do a little bit of a recap for the um, project as we have worked on it over the last um, three PIs. We started with a um, POC uh, that was back at the beginning of the year where we performed a proof of concept of a financial crime risk management solution composed exclusively out of open source components. Uh, our targets at the time was uh, to be able to do at least 3,000 transactions per second, and we managed to achieve a peak throughput exceeding 8,000 transactions per second for the rules that we had selected with a turnaround time of less than 35 milliseconds. So our goal was a high speed, highly performant architecture. And we selected a number of typologies that we wanted to evaluate based on text data that we had, test data that we had supplied to the platform. In the subsequent PI, we built on the work and the learnings that we had um, achieved in the POC and built the first layer of our architecture. Uh, we implemented a database to host our transactional information and our um, graph database. Uh, we implemented a Mojuloop instance to assist with testing and integration. We implemented with the initial stages of a continuous integration and continuous development pipeline and also a predicate builder to help with typology development and scoring. But ultimately our goal for that PI was to construct an end-to-end -end flow utilizing all of our implemented components. In our current PI, the large part of the theme of our PI was around building the data rails and the data pipeline for the project. So we wanted to implement Actio as an ISO 2022 compliant platform. And for that purpose, we built a number of our processors and components in our platform to be ISO 2022 compliant from a API um, all the way through up to our data preparation and ultimately also our data evaluation um, pipeline. Um, we are implementing data protection by design. So for that purpose, part of our data preparation routines were enhanced with uh, pseudonymization of customer information in the transaction record. And we also implemented into our existing channel architecture, a configuration driven rule and typology process in design, which we will take you through as well. Again, just as a reminder, the context within which Actio operates. Um, so Actio is a implemented in what we had identified as a semi-attached mode, where a financial crime risk management solution can function in a um, partnership with a switch or also in direct connection with the financial service providers attached to that financial ecosystem or even with a financial service provider that sits outside of the ecosystem. So the financial crime risk management solution can take on transaction traffic from any of those points in the ecosystem and do an evaluation on behalf of the client system. We didn't build the system or Mojulib does not intend to specifically interdict a transaction as we call it, where a transaction is to be blocked but a direct route to a DFSP can be provided the way the interdiction can happen if a DFSP wants to achieve that. It, we consider interdiction to be a core component of fraud risk management in general, even though that is not something that Mojuloop itself is intending to do. Our architecture primarily focused on Mojuloop scale um, and essentially high volume and, and large ecosystem transactions. 
but it must then also be able to cope with that small single DFSP who wants to have their transactions evaluated for fraud uh, in that smaller micro context. Data related to the transaction that is required for transaction monitoring is then for our purposes assumed to generally be supplied within the hub transaction messages. However, the architecture that we are building is if information is not available in the, in, in the, in the hub message, we have the opportunity to collect that information directly from other sources, including DFSP systems for enriching the transaction at the end of the day to be able to do um, a wider variety of typology evaluation over a transaction. We wanted to show you this slide to just bring you in on, on what the biggest challenges are for us in terms of evaluating fraud in an ecosystem such as Mojiloops. Um, so to understand the numbers, if you think about transaction monitoring as a volume challenge, uh, we have high volumes of data and a high degree of dynamism where the, the amount of work that we need to do for any transaction differs from one transaction to the next. If we look at a Mojiloop instance that is operating at 10,000 transactions per second, that would roughly translate then into 40,000 ISO 20022 messages per second. If you consider that a end-to-end -end transaction that covers all of the process steps through the request for a quote, the response, the ultimate request for a transfer, and also that response, all of those messages um, could be evaluated for frauds throughout that process. Each of those messages need to be evaluated against 80 typologies that we had selected that are appropriate for a Mojiloop hub instance and also for directly for a, a DFSP if the DFSP was talking to Actio. But it's important to remember that not every typology is necessarily evaluated for every message. For example, if a transaction doesn't contain any Forex, it wouldn't make sense for us to evaluate a typology that checks if there is fraud related to a Forex transaction. Each typology in turn comprises multiple rules. Um, we have fairly simple rule sets where a, a rule evaluates one attribute of a specific transaction to very complex rules that do deep reads into the transactional history to understand the behavior of a particular payer or even a payee. From that perspective, rules have variable execution times. Not every rule that we are proposing to implement will finish at the same time as every other rule. So we have to be able to accommodate that high level of variety and variation in, in the rule execution. Now, ultimately, one of the big goals for us and something that we originally struggled with in the POC, but we had made um, significant strides in resolving that is how do we make sure that a rule is, that is used by multiple typologies is only executed once in the evaluation of that transaction so that we don't waste processing time on, on, um, on executing a rule multiple times for every typology that needs a result. Against that background, um, to evaluate a single complete transaction, we're probably performing up to about a thousand evaluation processes, which increases the, the demand for performance on our platform quite significantly. Uh, it's not just about settling a transaction, but also doing all of those evaluation processes behind the scenes to make sure that that transaction can be settled safely. What we did in order to solve this problem was to prioritize the limited resources that we have at our disposal by devising what we call the channel architecture. Here we can assign rules to specific processing channels where those channels can be have dedicated resources that would make sure that the rules perform according to a specific set SLA. The variation or the variety according to which we can um, set up these channels would be for uh, speed or for specific functions. If you want to collect all of your Forex based rules and typologies into a specific Forex channel, that you can turn on or off based on where you are deploying or where the transaction is originating from, then you can do that. If you want to place your rules in a high speed channel that you want to be able to interdict from, then those rules could be given the lion's share of the resources and streamline specifically inside that channel to make sure that they complete within of the SLAs. For a, to make this work, 
we deployed a function as a service architecture as an alternative to your traditional publish and subscribe architecture. So rule and typology processors in this flow then act as discrete functions as a service. And they are forward chain. So the rules would post their results to a typology processor. And the typology processor would it post its results to a channel aggregation and decisioning processor. And behind the scenes, the channel router and setup processor determines which rules are to be invoked and which typology processors are required based on the attributes of a specific channel. For that, we then have dynamic determination of the required typologies and the rules. We evaluate the transaction, we determine the attributes and the nature of that transaction, and then we invoke all of the rules and typologies that we need to evaluate, creating the dynamism that we want in the rules evaluation, and also then making sure that we only call those things that are essential so that we can save processing time on, on, on essential tasks. I'm now going to hand over to Darshan, um, who's going to take us through the architecture um, underlying the platform. And then I'll be back in a couple of slides to talk through our delivery for the DI. Darshan, over to you. Thank you, Justice. And um, thank you for this opportunity. Now, as you can see on this slide, um, this is the high level architecture of the actual platform. Um, I know there's a lot of components, but it's, it's, it's by design. Um, if you look at the whole architecture, um, it's a mix of services and microservices. Again, the, the definition of services and microservices um, is a little bit more technical and we can go into details if required, but it, it's very modular. Uh, and individually, uh, these components, let's just call it components or services, can be optimized for performance. They can be scaled up and down to support different um, levels of traffic, as Justice mentioned, where there's 3,000 transactions per second, 8,000 or 10,000. And it's very flexible to support all possible rules and typology executions. Now, it also supports um, receiving transactions from um, a client, like, like a controller, like a switch, um, especially or from a client who can be a direct DFS pay. Now, the key thing is the Actio platform um, only processes and works with ISO 2022 format compliant transaction messages. So if you as DFS pay or Mojuloop already have 2022 compliant transactions, you can send it through and everything will process as designed. However, if you do not have ISO 2022 compliant transactions, then we provide something called an Actio payment platform adapter. Uh, you can see it um, on the left side in the uh, two gray boxes uh, right there. Thank you, Justice. Um, it will do the transformation. So whatever comes into the Actio platform will be ISO 2022 compliant. And as you could see, um, uh, we've designed the network of the Actio platform so you send everything through the API gateway. It does all the, the right authentication or authorization. And then you go into the flow or the critical path. Um, Justice, if I may request you to uh, 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 go to the next slide, uh, we can go to this, um, uh, this sort of a simpler view of the architecture that shows you the critical path. Again, there, there are a lot of other components uh, but this is this is the critical path and uh, other components that you do not see in this slide are different data stores or cache or uh, some things that, that will be either outside of the actual scope or will, will be uh, tackled in the, in the future PIs. Uh, for example, details on the workflow and interdiction and case management. But this is the main uh, transaction monitoring flow. So if if you follow me, um, you see the API gateway. Once you are inside the API gateway, you're properly authenticated and authorized. You start from the, that uh, block, which is the TMS or the transaction monitoring system. It's sort of the center top. 
And then it's it's an it's a it's an API that that receives the transaction, and then you go through the flow. Uh, uh, you go into uh, through data preparation and a channel routing setup processor, and then you have um, multiple rules processors, and then you have typology processor, and then you have channel aggregation and then transaction aggregation. So this is very much. A, a, the same thing, but a different view of the channel architecture that uh, Justice talked talk to us a couple of slides uh, before this. And this flow has been proven to work functionally uh, to be able to take a transactions, uh, do all the enrichment um, a process through multiple channels and, and different rule executions, uh, typology executions. And we end up with, uh, the uh, transaction um, aggregation decision processor. Now, this, this completes the flow. There are other components, but this is pretty much uh, what uh, this whole architecture is all about. This is the critical path. And this is designed and, and it works for both small or medium and large scale operations. Uh, however, some of the components are uh, more suitable for small scale. And specifically, um, I'm talking about OpenFast. So um, I, I wanna go into a little bit of detail uh, with respect to OpenFast and something um, that's also critical uh, to this architecture, which is gRPC. So Justice, if I may, uh, um, yeah, thank you. So this slide, um, I want to cover two important aspects of the architecture, one being OpenFast and second being gRPC. Now, OpenFast, as uh, most of you know, is a framework and infrastructure preparation system for building serverless platform components. That's, that's what we have. We have different services, they're, they're serverless. And the primary reason we had that in our architecture was for dynamic scaling of the components. Now, when you look at uh, gRPC, um, if, uh, for those who know, uh, remote procedure call has been around, I believe, for at least two decades. But Google really took it and 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 really made it uh, highly performant. Um, and then it's really alternative to HTTPS REST. Now, when you look at OpenFast, you're thinking about HTTPS REST, whereas gRPC is an alternative. Now, you did see that the architecture has multiple components. So the inter-service communication, so that the message going from one component to another, there is, there is definitely some time spent. And if we're talking about fast channels with uh, SLAs like 35 milliseconds or 100 milliseconds, each and every millisecond is important. And, and most of the time could potentially be consumed uh, in inter-service communication, which is why gRPC becomes very important and every millisecond saved uh, will make a big difference, uh, which is why it, it gains even more importance than what you can see when you look at the diagram. So um, when you look at the SLA for the overall transaction monitoring, uh, everything that we can do to optimize, we will. However, uh, while doing all this, um, we learned, um, you know, by experience that OpenFast and gRPC are not exactly compatible. Um, we we tried we tried uh, all possible permutations. There there is uh, there is also another thing in the architecture that's not visible. Uh, but it's all, there's uh, something called Linkerd, which is a service mesh. So taking open fast Linkerd gRPC, we tried everything possible. Uh, however, it, it just um, won't work together. So we reached out to OpenFast and the community and um, we found out that they have no plans to address this, no plans to rectify this, neither now, short term, nor it's on the roadmap. Uh, so that, that is a, a key concern. Uh, because now what happens is it's either open fast or gRPC. Now um, I, uh, let's move on to the next slide. Thanks, Justice. Thank you. So now, uh, as, as I said, um, we're faced with this challenge. 
OpenFast versus gRPC. Uh, OpenFast was chosen the architecture, um, again, primarily for auto scaling, but it relies on either HTTP or HTTPS. Obviously, we, we're doing everything HTTPS, uh, and it's there right now. So it's there, it's proven, it works functionally. Now, gRPC um, is also there. Um, we've proven that it works functionally. Uh, uh, the inter-service communication happens as per design, and it is known to significantly improve orders of magnitude. And, and we see it anecdotally. We see it uh, with unit testing that we've done. Um, now, architecturally, as I mentioned, we can either have gRPC or open fast, but not both. So what we need to do is we need to know, um, and we need to know quantitatively uh, with numbers as proof, which one is more important and which one will stay. So uh, when you look at gRPC in, in the, you know, uh, globally uh, in its community um, implemented by various organizations and, and groups, uh, it is shown to be about 10 times faster than rest. However, there is a lot of dependencies because when, when you're building, building um, a, test, a full test case, uh, you, you know, there is infrastructure, there is, you know, what exact uh, business functionality you're implementing. There's there's a lot of constraints, so we cannot take what's out there uh, as a proof for us. Even though it, it seems to be about 10x faster uh, for most cases. So in our case, we need to make sure it works exactly, uh, and it gives us this order of magnitude uh, improvement compared to HTTPS REST. So. We're going to, we are, we are going to, we are, we are start working on it and we will have those answers in the next couple of weeks. And that will prove that yes, it's orders of magnitude faster than open fast. And, um, and, you know, we are very optimistic, uh, you know, all the, all the reasons, uh, everything in terms of research and what we see uh, uh, in the community or ourselves that gRPC will be successful. There's absolutely nothing negative that comes out of it, but we, we act, want actual numbers within our actual platform, within our constraints, within the parameters and components that we have. And once that's that's done, we will make um, important decisions. Now, one thing that uh, I will uh, go back to open fast again is Kubernetes using HPA provides scaling too. So what, what that does is it makes OpenFast um, optional and not required. Now, if you, if you think about what OpenFast is, you know, again, um, it's, it's really a wrapper. So we can still have a service. It will still scale using uh, Kubernetes and different services can communicate with each other very fast um, uh, in uh, rather orders of magnitude fast compared to HTTP REST uh, using gRPC. So we are very optimistic and positive, but we will have the answers um, very, very soon. Just as I'll, I'll request next slide if you can. So now let's talk a little bit about data storage and specifically historic data storage. Um, Typology evaluations, also rule, rules evaluation, because typology, uh, you know, consists of one or more rules. Uh, it often requires, uh, for behavioral modeling, for um, detecting anomalies, for investigation support, for different pattern recognition models, or even for other purposes, um, historic data. So uh, we do plan to store historic data. Um, uh, for most types of historic data, most types of data, uh, we will store it for three months, uh, but specifically for historic data, we'll store it for 13 months so that we can cover uh, seasonal changes, we can cover the entire annual cycle, but we definitely don't want to store historic data for five or seven years. We want to cover it for, for um, annual behaviors like uh, Eid, Easter, Christmas, et cetera, where different transactions can happen and they happen probably on an annual basis and they are, they are good transactions. Uh, they are not something to worry about. Now, the historic data um, or the transaction data, uh, it comes in as JSON. So we 
will store it uh, as JSONs. So there's two types of um, uh, history. One is the JSON, as I just mentioned, but we will also store it uh, in a graph format for some graph use cases. And lastly, um, for data protection, um, which uh, is absolutely critical, uh, you know, when, when you look at a transaction monitoring system or, or an uh, anti-financial crime system like Actio, if you want to make, you know, there will be some PII data, there will be some fields. So we want to make sure we pseudonymize them and we build um, proper lookups. So at any point in time or within any component, um, it's, it's all pseudonymized and, and we have done that. Uh, so we've implemented it and it, it works as design. Uh, and this is critical part of keeping data protected. And in terms of security, um, data will get persisted. So we want to make sure when the data gets persisted, uh, it gets encrypted. Um, so that's, that's, a, that's a, a key technical requirement for us uh, as part of the actual platform. Justice, if I may uh, request the next slide, please. Thank you. So as we were talking about encryption at rest, uh, it's, it's important uh, and it's absolutely critical and it's not something we can compromise on. So now we are uh, at the slide um, that says transaction history, Arango DB to Druid. Why, why are we here? Why, why are we discussing this? Um, we are because Arango DB was in the architecture as a store for transaction history. Great database, um, multimodal, you're talking about graph, obviously that's the that's key selling point, but they also support um, uh, JSON stores, document stores, uh, I mean, uh, all possible, all ma major possible modes for, for database. So it seemed like the, the answer for us. And in, in many ways, it, it, it really is. But when you look at performance, when you look at ease of use, uh, working within a Kubernetes uh, native environment and all that. So it's, it's fantastic database in every possible way. Um, however, when we started using it, we found out that um, encryption at rest is not part of the community license. And when you look at Actio, Actio is composed exclusively of um, under at least an Apache 2.0 license. So this is where it gets tricky. Um, you know, it's open source and now RangoDB does not support encryption at rest as part of the open source of community license. But um, before we even go further, uh, there's also Druid in our architecture. Um, Druid, uh, as, as most of you know, is a distributed OLAP. Um, and it can serve as a JSON store. Um, it has uh, uh, good data ingestion options and it's really known for, for its querying or its read, read abilities. Uh, and it provides encryption as, at rest as part of its community license. So we don't have to look further. Um, our AngularDB um, not providing encryption at rest is, is, is a no-go for us uh, in terms of transaction history. And Druid can, you know, Druid provides that and Druid's already part of it. So going forward, Druid will be the transaction history uh, data store where you have all these records and will also uh, uh, be used for other um, uh, data store purposes, which are JSON based. Um, with that, I will hand it back to Justice for the rest of the presentation. And I thank you again. Thank you, Darshan. What I'd like to go through now is just an overview of the components um, that we did build and the work that we had done over the um, past uh, three months of this quarter of the PI. This is an end-to-end -end representation of our Actio flow, um, just for context. So, the information flows from a payer um, through a DFSP, and at that point, we would uh, the message will be handed over to Actio for evaluation. We have a number of steps in our flow, covering the uh, Actio TMS API, a data preparation step, um, the channel router and setup processor, 
uh, the rules processors where evaluations take place, and then the typology processor itself. The work that we did during this PI covered these components. So as I mentioned before, our predominant theme for the PI was the um, ISO 2022 implementation and building the data rails for that. We took the post quotes message starting at the adapter, converted that into an ISO PAIN 001 message and submitted that message through the Actio TMS API where the validation and authentication happens. Um, data preparation, we did our signalization on that message. Uh, we submitted that message to our channel router so that the channel router could um, determine which rules and typologies to send it to. At the moment, we haven't yet started full, fully fledged rules and typologies development. So we built a sample processor as a template for that work. And then um, the typology processor itself is where the transaction ultimately terminates um, in our flow at the moment. Uh, work coming up will be to complete the rest of the flow for an end-to-end -end flow that will then be fully ISO 2022 compliant, at least as far as the post quotes message is concerned. So just as an, a, a more succinct objective or a summary of the objectives, one of the things that we also worked on starting at the front of the pipeline and working our way back is we put together a proposal for an integration design into Mojuloop itself. Um, we are currently reviewing that with the design authority and hopefully we'll have a, a answer on um, or an approval on a way to go forward. In addition to that, we prototyped an ISO 2022 compliant payment platform adapter specifically for Mojuloop. So that takes on the post quotes message, converts it into an ISO 2022 compliant message. Um, we then had to, from previous work that we had done, we had established the TMS API or the Transaction Monitoring Service API. Um, we updated that now to also be ISO 2002 into compliant. And then the data flows inside data preparation or NIFI, all of those flows are also now ISO 2002 compliant. If you say ISO 2022 a lot, it gets easier to say. Uh, implementation of pseudonymization um, that we did in the data preparation area. And then finally, configuration driven and ISO 2022 compliant transaction evaluation routine and processing. That's the work that actually happens inside our channel architecture to evaluate a specific transaction for fraud. Um, alongside that, the work that we did around bedding down the CICD work that we started in um, PI2 post the POC, and then also automated testing. Um, that is essential for us as we now head into the rules and typology development to be able to automatically do the testing required as we continuously deploy new rule processors and typologies into our architecture for, um, for, for ongoing improvement of the platform. A quick overview just of the proposed integration. Um, what we are proposing to deliver or um, what, we, what we need is we require real-time transaction feed from Mojuloop into Actio through the payment platform adapter. Um, we are proposing a additional listener um, that would then monitor a queue or a um, topic that is built out of a subset of traffic um, in the topic events, which is the uh, queue where everything in Mojuloop ends up. Um, we will take all of the four transactions as they leave the platform and then um, transpose those into a, a Kafka queue that we could then uh, listen to and export that message into the payment platform adapter. The payment platform adapter would then from there do the conversion. Um, both the listener and the um, payment platform adapter we are proposing to locate inside the um, third party um, API area. Um, the listener itself would be a little bit closer to the modular platform. So this is the proposal that we're currently working on. Um, we went, we reviewed with the design authority uh, a couple of weeks ago and we are expecting that there will be approval in the next couple of weeks and then we can proceed to the next step. The payment platform adapter prototype, um, we mapped all of the Mojuloop messages um, to ISO 2022 messages. So there are the four messages out of the Mojuloop platform. Uh, with support from Michael and the ISO 2022 work stream in Mojuloop itself, we used a lot of their um, workers input 
to do the mapping for both post quotes, put quotes, and then post transfers and put transfers to either payment initiation messages, which is the closest equivalent that ISO has to cater for a quotes message that is devoid of an actual transaction or settlement. And then there's the um, two PACS messages that relate to the actual transfers um, based on uh, the, the, the mojo messaging. Inside that payment platform adapter, we have implemented Swagger message validation. And that basically takes the ISO 2022 compliant XSDs and um, applies them in the, to the incoming message. Um, and then we convert that message into a uh, JSON ISO 2022 message that we can then transmit from the payment platform adapter into the TMS API via a HTTPS REST query or message. And in addition to that, we implemented Ambassador and Keycloak to handle the authentication and also the exposure of the um, API endpoint for secure communications. Behind this, there's also ELK for logging and telemetry, uh, Elastic and Kibana. Can't remember what the L is for, I'm sorry. Uh, the, uh, Logstash, sorry. <laughs> Logstash, thank you very much, Darshan. I knew you'd know. Um, that we also implemented to do the logging. At the moment, because it's a prototype, we coupled this um, component into our existing infrastructure, but the intention is for these components to be fully standalone, and then we will be decoupling these once we move out of a prototype stage and into the build so that this component can be standalone and can also then be deployed into the um, third-party API area inside Moduloop to collect and then route transactions to the TMS API. As I mentioned, we enhanced the Transaction Monitoring Service API. Um, we implemented two of the messages, the PANE001 and the PAC001. So those are both the equivalent messages for the post quotes and post transfers. Um, coming up, we will still do the um, additional messages, which is the response message, uh, which is the pain 013 and the PAC 002. On the Transaction Monitoring Service API, again, um, Swagger message validation, and we implemented Ambassador and Keycloak to handle the uh, security and authentication and secure access. In data preparation, we did quite a little bit of work in, in NiFi. Um, firstly, we implemented that pain 001 message all the way through um, NiFi, uh, routing in and out. But then we also implemented personal data pseudonymization. So we implemented a um, framework for pseudonymization within NiFi, where if we evaluate a transaction as it passes through, we can um, pseudonymize the debtor account and the creditor account information into a secure key. Um, it's a hash-based message authentication code, uh, HMAC SHA-256, for those of you who know what that is, um, cryptography. So the key itself is derived from a one-way encrypted routine. Um, because at some point, for the most part, what this offers us is the key itself is secure and it's resistant to a number of forms of attack, in particular uh, brute force attacks against um, the pseudonym. But the there are certain downstream processes, and in particular, when you get to the investigation of a specific case, that somebody may need to unwind the pseudonym again. You cannot reverse or decrypt the, the, the pseudonym. You have to provide for a secure lookup service instead, where you provide the pseudonym that we have given you, and we would then give you the detailed information. That is obviously highly sensitive and will be restricted in terms of access and also in terms of function, who the people are who are able to scrutinize the information at that level of detail would be very closely controlled. That lookup table itself is also encrypted, um, hence the need for encrypted data storage in our platform yet again. Um, we have to encrypt the lookup and then it gives us an additional layer of protection. At the moment, the lookup table itself is, is um, on our to-do list for the next PI, but so far the pseudonymization is complete and functional. In addition to pseudonymization, also in NiFi, we implemented a, 
we conducted a data enrichment pilot based on United Nations sanctions data, where we are scraping um, the United Nations sanctions database off the United Nations sanctions um, website, and then ingesting that into the platform and prototyping enrichment into the transaction itself. So we can set an indicator in the transaction that determines whether or not the person that is associated with the transaction is present on a United Nations sanctions list. That for us is a proof of concept, mostly for data enrichment. In the long term, data enrichment will probably be more closely driven by the needs of rules for specific data that isn't part of the transaction itself. So as we mentioned earlier, we've created the functionality to ingest additional supporting data to enrich a transaction. At the moment, we expect that most of the information that we need should be part of the messages that we receive. But in the event that they are not, and in the event that there is additional information that could supplement a transaction, we could then use this mechanism that we have built to collect additional information either about the transaction or environmental information related to the transaction. So for example, IP address region mapping or the sanctions data as we mentioned here. A brief overview of pseudonymization. Um, so from our perspective, um, we needed, we're including this in the presentation. I'm just going to go through this very quickly, but pseudonymization adds for us an additional level of protection against exposure of customer information. We know the information that we are reviewing in the platform is sensitive, specific to customers, and it's part of our process to build security and, and data protection by design into the platform. All of our platform activities are logged in detail but the logs themselves should never expose personal information. So the, the information that should be shown in a log is information that had already been pseudonymized, especially if certain processes or certain data is vulnerable to insider attack, a administrator who's able to view the logs won't necessarily know who the logs are about. Similarly, somebody who's investigating a case shouldn't necessarily know that they who the people are involved in the case because they may alert criminals about them being the subject of an investigation. So pseudonymization is generally retained for unless there is a very special circumstance or right at the end of a process if you do need to do some kind of reporting to a regulator. Um, at the moment, our policy for pseudonymization is you will only see data if you need to, to be able to see it for the work that you are doing. And we built this. Uh, this is our sequence diagram where we are building pseudonym into a, cut, a knife -like processor. Um, we calculate our pseudonym. We have to check against our data store to see if that pseudonym already exists. Otherwise, we will create a new record. Um, pseudonymization relies on a accurate resolution of the customer information. So the, if you calculate or if you transpose two characters of a person's name, that would calculate to a different pseudonym. In the next PI, we'll be looking at entity resolution where we can make sure that a pseudonym is only a part of the process on generating a unique key for someone. And the information that we are then pseudonymizing will be based on a unique version of a person's identity. Uh, that's work that's coming up. But at the moment, we are straightforward calculating the pseudonym based on the um, private information provided in the Mojilip message. And that information is also used to resolve to a customer's account. So the variations between two consecutive instances of an account between two transactions is less likely. One of the things we're particularly excited about in, in our last PI is we implemented a configuration driven design in our channel architecture. So in the past, what we would have had to do is we would have had to, for example, hard code the, the, the functionality for every specific typology in, 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 in the platform. So if there was a typology that did an evaluation for scams or a typology that did the evaluation for money laundering, that typology would be a discrete piece of code. Um, but when we did a lot of our work at the end of the previous PI, we realized that there's a lot of common work being done specifically in the typology processor side. 
So we wanted to look for a way where we could abstract the typology into a single, almost a topology rules processor um, where it can do all of the work on behalf of all of the topologies, but ingest its configuration through an external configuration source. And when we started looking at that, um, we also realized that we had an opportunity to solve a different problem that we'd also had. So the, the way that rules and typologies are orchestrated within a channel, we wanted to make sure that that remained stateless in the first place. So we don't have to constantly transfer state from one processor to another. Um, and also that the, there is some sort of coherence between the rules and the typology without specifically building that coherence into the typology processor. For that purpose, we built what we call a network map. And the network map determines the routing of a specific transaction through all of the rules and the typologies. The channel router and setup processor that you see here at the top, that processor's function is to interpret the map that it derives from a config database and then prunes that map based on the attributes of the transaction. So for example, in our Forex example from before, if the transaction itself does not contain any Forex, the network map will, or the, trans, the, the, the channel router will prune all of the rules and typologies from the network map that relate to Forex. And it will then submit that transaction to only those rule processors that need to evaluate the transaction. The rule processors will then ultimately post their results to this single typology processor, which will again interpret the map to understand which other rules are required for that typology processor and also whether or not it had already received some of the rule results for that typology processor. And once a typology had um, been completed and all of the results had been submitted, it would then be in a position to calculate the score based on all of those rule results. The mapping of the rules to a specific typology expression is also contained in the config database. This allows us to have this single central typology processor in place that we can then use to calculate a typology score. Um, in terms of, I, I realized that we are running very, very close to the end of the session. So I'm going to have to speed up a bit. Um, in terms of the transaction evaluation, we implemented channel routing with the map and that also included the um, pain 001 message as a extension of the quote. And then beyond that, rule processing. We took one of our rule processes that we had um, delivered before and created a pattern for rules development coming up now. Rules development is largely the focus of our upcoming PI. And a lot of the work that we have done now is to be able to put us in a position where we can do that rules development. Um, this is also in PI3. And we'll be concluding this work by the end of this week. Um, the team is still busy developing. Uh, we've extended our sprint so that we can complete this work by the end of this week and then start working on the rules from the next PI. Um, our scaling and parallelization, as we Darshan mentioned before, is facilitated through Linkerd, OpenFast, and GRPC. Just a quick summary then of what our intended scope is for PI4. Darshan mentioned a gRPC proof of performance, and that's one of the tasks that we are doing early on. And we're also looking at implementing the Mojuloop integration that is currently under review. And then in addition to that, completing the work that we had started in the payment platform adapter as a prototype to deliver the transformation of all of the other Mojuloop messages through the payment platform adapter. That would then mean that we could extend the TMS API to include all of the remaining ISO messages. So the put versions of both quotes and transfers will then go into the TMS API. Um, before we do pseudonymization, we are going to be doing entity resolution so that we have a better view of the unique entities in our database and be able to assign them their unique um, pseudonyms after the entity resolution process has been completed. We're also going to be creating transaction graphs out of the data transactions that we receive. So a graph is essentially just a network map that shows all of the transactions between all of the participants in the, in the network, which allows us a far more efficient way to do those kinds of queries that rely on a graph um, solution rather than a traditional relational solution. 
And we're also going to be writing away our transaction history encrypted as Darshan mentioned into, into Druid. Um, there's the additional pseudonymization of additional fields. So for the moment, we are only pseudonymizing the account information, but we also intend to pseudonymize additional information like somebody's um, first name, last name, and uh, date of birth and so on. And then the main thrust of our next PI is typology and rules development. Uh, we are planning a large number of typologies and rules. Our short list of typologies up to the end of the project over the next three PIs is 80 typologies, which probably comprise in total of a, about 100 rules. Um, we're going to start doing that development work now. And then finally, if any data enrichment is required by those rules, then that will be added as we go along. If a rule identifies a data source that is needed to be able to complete that rules evaluation, we'll build an integration into that data source through our enrichment pattern. And there's the last two steps of the end-to-end -end flow that we will also aim to complete. Those function very similar to the current typology processor, which is also um, configuration driven, and we'll be implementing those um, at the um, the end of the PI. And then my last slide finally is um, we would definitely like to talk with current and prospective Mojilib implementers about requirements for financial crime detection and prevention. Uh, we need to know specifically what it is that you would need from a platform such as ours and what we need to make sure that we are building in the platform now to cater for your specific requirements. As we are now nearing sort of the end of our minimum viable product, this is an opportunity for us to make sure that our product is prepared and ready to, to, to enter a um, production environment. And then finally, anyone involved in um, SoupTech, um, supervisory technology, technologies, whether those are regulators or implementers, um, if you could provide insight and assist us in the investigation and reporting functionality, how should we be delivering the data to you as a regulator to assist you in your regulatory activities over the entities um, that you are uh, supervising. And in particular, we'd like to invite um, Mass and Tips to assist us in this regard. If you could um, reach out to somebody that we could contact or speak to about your requirements, um, we'd really appreciate it. And uh, thank you very much. I know we're at the end. I don't know if we have time for questions, Simeon. Uh, no, but there are some really good discussions going on in the chat on uh, the on Pathable. So if you want to hop in there for a bit, that would be great. Cool. We'll, we'll look into that. Thank you very much for the opportunity, everyone. Um, enjoy the rest of the of the convening and your evening. Thank you so much, Dashan. Thank you so much, uh, Justice. Okay. Um, this brings us to the end. This is our, our penultimate session. There's one last session today. We have the open discussion uh, forum. Um, and just sharing my screen here real quick. Um, the open, we have only one topic today, so it won't be breakouts, but rather a, a presentation on RTplex Payment Manager. Um, uh, the Motorsbox uh, team has got a really good excitement, uh, exciting announcement um, for us. So why don't we hop into the, that last session on the open discussion and that will close out our day. See you then.